My name is Matt Hopper and I live on a council estate in Hull, England. And six years ago, I made a film about me and my relationship with the place. In some ways, a lot has happened since the first film and each location has changed. Some subtly, some dramatically. But I think the biggest change has been in myself and the way I feel about this place. In this film, I'm going to visit each of the locations from the first film and speak a little about them. Back when I made the first film, I got a kick out of romanticising and mythologising the ordinariness of it all. But since then, it seems as though reality has caught up with me and I now see the estate in a more literal sense. I still feel lucky to live here, but I've lost a lot of energy in the last few years. I was almost 40 when I began to study art a decade ago and the infinite potential of what I could create gave me a thrill. I projected the energy I felt onto the drab setting of the council estate. It seemed like an absurd, almost perverse thing to do. This was the last place on earth an artist should get excited about. But I'd developed a love of the absurd from my early years, starting with my discovery of the Beano in 1975. Creative thinking is the key to escape. But in order to transcend the concrete and the tarmac, you first need that primitive spark of resistance. The kind of spark that drove Duchamp in 1917 to turn a urinal upside down and call it art. The kind of spark that drove Rob Tyner in 1968 to scream Take out the jails, motherfucker! The Bricknell Estate was my urinal and I tried to turn it on its head. But my inversion of the place was more metaphysical than literal. I painted myself 20 feet tall, suspended naked above our council estate's very own stone circle. I drove around a roundabout for an hour. And I spent a year here on the dole as part of a heroic performance art project titled The Unemployed Artist. So much went wrong in that year and I began to feel as though my world was on a grand spiral into oblivion. I'd hoped to transcend the reality of the situation, focusing on the grand artistic vision. But reality caught up with me. The quiet empty streets and the big trees used to feel like a refuge and sometimes a blank canvas for art projects. But now it seems like there's no escape and all I see is bricks and mortar and concrete. The small plastic hook thing used to symbolise hope. I used to look for it when I walked past it on my morning constitutionals around the estate, and seeing it gave me a sense of permanence and comfort, like some strange esoteric sigil. It disappeared from its home near this drain soon after I made my first film, and when it came to it I wasn't really that bothered. Of course, I was being kind of tongue-in-cheek about its significance, but to a certain extent its disappearance did represent the end of a period in my life. Its disappearance even felt appropriate, like the universe was trying to tell me something. The True Cross, Excalibur, the Spear of Destiny, they've all gone, if they ever existed, and the universe marches on, not hostile, just indifferent. The bridge has changed subtly. A couple of years back, a sinister looking communications mast and surveillance cameras appeared there. At first they freaked me out, but eventually they became invisible. It still feels like a bridge between two worlds, and I've yet to make the crossing to the other side. Funnily enough though, a few years back, I inadvertently ended up exploring the roads and paths beyond. I had to pick someone up in my car there, and as I approached their flat, I saw the bridge looming at the bottom of the street. It felt like a huge letdown as I realised I was seeing the bridge from the other side for the first time. There was no getting out of it. Fate had brought me here in its own unmystical way, with no ritual and no ceremony. Looking across the train tracks on my walks, I'd imagined for years what it might look like over there. 
and in seconds the infinite possibilities of a Shangri-La collapsed into a quantum wave function of soul-crushing reality. Streets of well-maintained housing association flats and tidy bungalows. A pleasant suburban cul-de-sac with none of the strange idiosyncrasies I'd imagined. I was kinda disappointed. But someday I will make the crossing. Not yet though. Not yet. The cat's paw prints are still there. I doubt they'll be going anywhere for a long time. They may even outlive me. I hardly ever go for walks around the estate anymore, so I don't really see them or contemplate them. But I suppose it's nice to know they exist. I remember when I was at school, our cross-country runs used to take us down here, on our way to the fields behind the estate. I told Dad about this, and he remembers doing the same in the 50s. He also told me that he fell out of one of these very trees, and broke his arm, back when this place was a farm. The whole grammar school used to sit here in these fields before it was demolished in 2004, and the land has now been sold to developers who will be building houses here soon. They illegally tore down all the trees last year in preparation. It was nesting season and I immediately rang the police and the council and contacted wildlife groups. But no action was taken. This place will soon be a little less peaceful. Suburbia is becoming more and more cramped. An escape is becoming more and more difficult. I love all the trees of the estate. This is the one constant through the years. The old trees give the council estate its soul, and their roots link back to a different age when we were more connected to the land. They're the homes of birds and insects, as they've always been. But this line of gnarled and ancient hawthorns represent ghosts of field boundaries that exist now only on antique maps. Empires come and go, and the maps are redrawn, but the trees remain, unmoved. This location has hardly changed at all, although I did spot this brick recently. It was above head height and was being slowly ingested by the tree. But when I came to film it a couple of weeks later, I couldn't find it. After searching in vain for a few minutes, I noticed this sad little stump, hidden away in the grass. The tree with the magic brick had gone. Who knows what crime it had been guilty of. Whatever it was, I don't care. I'll remember that tree and its brick. Even if no one else will. This is the location that's physically transformed the most. The stone circle has gone replaced by a huddle of cramped dwellings. It feels claustrophobic and is completely unrecognisable. When this council estate was built in the 1960s, the architects tried to give the place a village feel by giving all the homes decent gardens and leaving green spaces between the houses. These new houses are in conflict with the aesthetic and wreck the harmony of the estate. I really miss the stone circle. I watched as they carted it away and flattened the ground that had been landscaped a couple of years earlier. This act of destructive violence would not have been allowed if the stones had been placed there with great reverence 4,000 years ago to honour the ancestors or the gods or whatever. But because the council dumped them there four years back with heavy machinery, they were fair game. And the world is now a little darker. But at the end of the day, I guess they were just a pile of old rocks. These fields are the last surviving corners of the ancient West Bulls and Wise's farms. The hedgerows are medieval and are the estranged parents of the scraggy rows of hawthorns that reappear deeper in the estate, as seen earlier in this film. A year after I made my first film, I put a lot of work into making a concrete memorial to the people who'd worked these farms through the centuries. 
I cemented it in place here underneath these trees and I hoped it might remain here for a long time but sadly within a week it had been smashed. In my previous film I began this final segment with the words This is where Hull ends. But I'm not sure that's true. I like to think that Hull sort of gradually peters out after this point. There's been a long running dispute over who actually owns the fields beyond. And that's cool, it feels like a kind of no man's land. In my first video I mentioned the Gallic Celts last stand against the might of Rome. And I'd been thinking about the way the Celts venerated borderlands as a kind of spiritual no man's land. Marshes were especially important and were seen as an interzone between the world of the living and the world of the dead. This area was drained in the medieval period, but interestingly in the Iron Age it was marshland, and just beyond those trees part of a Celtic chariot was found. I have a theory that this spot has always been a spiritual interzone. It does have a strange indefinite timeless feel to me. After building these ramparts to stop the travellers camping in the fields, the council didn't bother to maintain them, and they're now overgrown the weeds spreading out as they eat away at the tarmac. Nature is infinite. It regenerates, it replicates, it evolves. But everything we build is dead and will decay. <laughs>